Max highlights. Coming up on the show. Cool concerts. Chill out in the ice dome in an Italian ski resort. The Art of Start, an exhibition of opening credits from famous films. Sale of the Century, the collection of Yves Saint Laurent and his partner Pierre Berger under the hammer. Euromax highlights, and here's your host, Robin Merrill. Hello from Berlin, and for the last 30 seconds, you've just seen what's called the opening credits, giving you an idea of the type of show Euromax is and its content. The same goes for a film. The opening credits set up what the film is all about, except in just a few cases like the Pink Panther movies, for instance, where the credits have taken on a life of their own. Opening credits generally are an art form in themselves. Fast-paced and in-your-face, or sleek and suggestive. Over the past decades, the film industry has produced opening credits in all different shapes and sizes, some more memorable than others. A new exhibition in Berlin now explores the rich diversity of opening sequences in film. 54 clips are being shown at the Institute for Contemporary Art, each one a work of art in itself. For media expert Elisabeth Prommer, the opening credits are more than just a buffer between the adverts and the main film. During the opening credits, we begin to slip into the world of cinema. We've got our popcorn, we've put our coats to the side, we've watched the ads, and the credits let us know that the film is starting. Opening credits have a long tradition, dating back to the very inception of film history. In 1926, German director Lotte Reiniger added a section at the start of her film The Adventures of Prince Ahmed to introduce the characters to her audience. In the 1950s, the practice gained significance when workers' unions made a benchmark decision that all those collaborating in the film production must get a mention in the opening credits. You have to get everyone's name and job into the credits. That's the content. And the director decides what form they will take. Will it be a list of names or be a section of its own? Most directors opt for the latter, using their openers to plug their big stars. In that sense, opening trailers have developed into the feature film's little sister, a new form of art. One legendary example, James Bond. Both the opener and the theme tune have become a real trademark in the world of cinema. Not a Bond girl, but a real looker nonetheless. Jane Fonda's gravity-defying space strip in the opener of the 1968 Franco-Italian film Barbarella. Just goes to show that science fiction isn't all just robots and rockets. The planets all stand still. The opener plays with our expectations, provokes our curiosity and makes us wonder what the film will be about. But there's not always an attractive actress to spice up the opener. Often designers work with graphic elements that mirror the film's plot through animation. A prime example is the Pink Panther. Here we've got the film Inspector Clouseau, a cartoon of the Pink Panther who doesn't actually appear in the film. It stars in the trailer. It gives life to a whole new art form and a completely new character. The Pink Panther became such a hit with the audience that the cartoon figure was soon given his own television series, eventually becoming more famous than Inspector Clouseau himself. 
The exhibition shows that the film before the film is alive and well. A concert hall over 3,000 metres above sea level, high up in the mountains, is where we're off to now. And a concert hall made out of ice. And the music instruments played in it made out of ice as well. Terje Isunset from Norway makes the instruments and plays them, and it all happens at the Ice Music Festival in Bolzano in northern Italy. Gravand Glacier in the Alps of South Tyrol. Tucked away in a valley here lies the ice dome. As big as a house, its cupola is hidden under a meter-high ceiling of ice and snow. And here, at the center of it all, is Norwegian ice music pioneer Terje Isungset. It was like also a feeling that I was discovering something new. Uh, I discovered new sounds. And uh, I really want to share these sounds with as many people as possible. It's like finding a new flower that no one has ever seen. And I want people to see this flower. Terje Isungset creates his instruments from blocks of ice. He makes new ones for every place he performs, using ice from that region. The only tool he uses is an extremely sharp fisherman's knife. It takes him around five days to craft all the instruments for a concert. And even then, chance plays a big role. I cannot see any uh, absolute factors. The only thing I know that the ice has to be as clear as possible, for sure. But then, after this, I can have 100 pieces of this and maybe one of them sounds. And I don't know why. Isungset searches for the unique sound hidden in each piece of ice, and usually he finds it. I don't try to copy an existing instrument. I don't want to make a violin or a cello or a harp that looks exactly like um, the instrument itself. I try to, to just to get the eyes to sing, that's my thing. So I'm, I'm not so into copying other instruments but trying to create a new instrument that has the sound of the eyes itself. Winter sports lovers come straight from the slopes to the chilly depths of the ice dome. They're here to listen to the free concert Isungset is giving with singer Lena Niemark. Performing underneath a dome of ice gives the music a truly unique sound. Chills went down my spine. Her voice and the mood were fantastic. I'm moved and impressed. It was wonderful, a very archaic experience. You think you were somewhere in the Arctic desert two million years ago. It was most impressive. It's unbelievably moving to have this feeling of being alone and listening to music. Very nice. It's time for the skiers to leave the ice dome and head back to the slopes. What remains is the memory of an extraordinary sound experience, one that's bound to last longer than Terje Isungset's delicate ice instruments. The very first part of Germany I ever set eyes on was the Black Forest, from above. And it just seemed to go on forever, trees as far as the eye could see. Well, it is big, covering an area of around 12,000 square kilometres in the southwest of the country. Millions of tourists tramp through it each year, and it is this country's most famous natural landmark. A new photographic exhibition has just opened in a small town in the region. The ancient Romans called it Silva Nigra, the dark or black forest. For centuries, its picturesque landscape has lured travelers, artists, and photographers from near and far to southern Germany. The 
Pottery Museum in Staufen is currently showing an exhibition of photographs documenting the Black Forest. Out of more than 300,000 images, the curator selected 100, shot by six photographers from different generations. Everyone sees the Black Forest from a different perspective. Each photographer has different interests and impressions. This creates a wider spectrum. And different photographers show just how multifaceted the Black Forest is. From landscape photographer Eugen Holdemann to photojournalist Alvin Töller. In the 1950s, Töller took many pictures of local people, women making cuckoo clocks, or farmhands at the Harvest Festival. He really loved the flora and fauna of the area and all the customs and trades of the Black Forest, which were hard to find even back in those days. These pictures by Georg Röpke date back to 1900, when many women here still wore the Bollenhut or hat with pom-poms. Röpke also photographed farmhouses typical of the Black Forest. Some of them, such as the 18th century Hugenhof, still exist. In 1900, Röpke photographed the Höllentalbahn, a steep railway line that still exists today and is used as a mode of transport by hundreds of tourists. The Höllental train opened up the Black Forest to tourism. Before it was built, it was hard to get to the Black Forest up in the hills. The station in the valley is called Himmelreich, Kingdom of Heaven, and the train travels up the Höllental or Hell Valley. Der Weg hinauf, uh, Höllental. Lake Titisee, here shot in 1900, has always been a popular tourist destination. Today, visitors from all over the world come here to enjoy the fresh air and perhaps even buy a cuckoo clock. Der Schwarzwald wird the Bollenhut, Black Forest Cake and Cuckoo Clocks are obviously still part of the Black Forest, part of the culture. But these days the tourism offices are also trying to target younger tourists. Winter sports or walking, tourists from all over come here to enjoy the fabulous nature. The Black Forest is by far not as dark as its name suggests, and no matter how much it has changed over the years, its magical ability to attract people shows no sign of fading. And it's just as beautiful in the summer. Now, when it comes to art collections, nothing has created quite such a furore as the recent auction of Yves Saint Laurent's private collection in Paris. It is undoubtedly one of the most wide-ranging art collections ever built up over five decades by Saint Laurent and his lifelong partner, Pierre Berger. For three days, Paris was the centre of attention for the art world. It was a must-see event for art collectors. Paris's Grand Palais was temporarily transformed into an auction hall, with some of the most impressive examples of modern art up for grabs. Les Coucou Tapis Bleu et Rose by Henri Matisse, for example, was auctioned off for 32 million euros. In one evening alone, the auction broke seven world records for art sales. It could have been a war zone. Art lovers were desperate to get their hands on their favorite works, at any cost. A wooden statue by Constantin Brancusi was one of those record breakers, selling for 26 million euros. It's the first artwork that Yves Saint Laurent and Pierre Berger, his partner in his private life and in business, bought in the early 70s from Parisian art dealer Alain Tarica. Back then, Yves Saint Laurent already had an international reputation, and he and Berger began making money from art. At that time, art wasn't worth as much as it is now, especially not works like these. Before the start of the auction, the Brancusi sculpture was exhibited in the Grand Palais together with 700 other works. The decor in the viewing rooms was designed to resemble that of the home of Yves Saint Laurent and Pierre Berger. 
The collection comprised not just paintings, but sculptures, furniture, and other objects. For three days, members of the public were invited to view these artworks free of charge. And the crowds were enormous. Some people queued for up to four hours in the hope of catching a glimpse of the unique collection before it was sold off. Other items put up for auction were a Piet Mondrian painting that had inspired one of Saint Laurent's most memorable dresses. Yves Saint Laurent designed his Mondrian dresses in the 1960s, but he only bought the painting 20 years later. The Mondrian series also went under the hammer for top prices. Most of the buyers were private art collectors. But three works were also bought up by the Paris museums, Musée d'Orsay and the Centre Pompidou. But Pierre Berger will get to keep one of the highlights of the collection, Picasso's musical instrument on a table. It didn't reach the minimum price of 25 million euros during bidding. That's no problem. I'm very happy to be able to keep it. It's been a great evening, we've taken in a record amount, and I get to keep a Picasso. What more could I want? The proceeds of the auction are due to go to the Yves Saint Laurent Foundation and for AIDS research. British hat maker Stephen Jones is the curator of a unique hat exhibition currently on in London. Hats down the ages from 600 BC until the present day. It's the first such exhibition the renowned Victoria and Albert Museum in London has ever staged and features over 300 pieces of headgear, including a few of Stephen Jones' own creations. Art or just a superfluous bit of chintz? For many years, a hat was regarded as an absolute must. Now, hats in all shapes and sizes are celebrating a comeback. Flippant. Fun, practical, or pretty. I mean, that's the main point about hats nowadays, that they are fun. You know, they they transport you into another dimension when you put them on. Everybody feels different when they have a hat. Stephen Jones is considered the most renowned hat maker in the world of fashion. He's creative and eccentric, and his designs play with different eras, styles, and cultures. The design guru works with Europe's leading fashion houses and particularly closely with celebrity designer John Galliano. He worked for Galliano's personal collection, but also for the label Dior. Stephen Jones? Yes. I think he's probably the best milliner in the world. And he's been designing hats for more than three decades. He never ever loses his temper. He can create anything from a black beret to a space helmet. Definitely in the, in the 1980s, it was a very important time for hats in Britain. Of course, you had Princess Diana, who was a style icon, and because of royal protocol, had to wear hats. And Stephen designed hats for her. Um, but also, Stephen was very much part of the new romantic scene, that club scene, um, and, and sort of um, very much fashion expressing individuality. Um, so, yeah, he, he's, he's been very important in reviving the hat. Now the famous milliner has broadened his scope. For London's Victoria and Albert Museum, Jones has put together a hat exhibition. It ranges from an ancient Egyptian Anubis mask right up to last season's models. They communicate more than anything else. Um, you know, in tribal society, you could be naked, but you will always decorate your head in some way. And, for example, uh, if you're dressing up a baby or a child, you'll always put something funny on its head. It just is a very primary act of being. In Covent Garden, at the bustling heart of London's shopping district, Stephen Jones has a shop that sells hats costing up to thousands of pounds. 
His clientele include everyone from rock stars to royals, burlesque dancer Dita Von Tees. This hat by Stephen Jones was worn by Camilla Parker Bowles on her wedding day. For Kylie Minogue's tour Showgirl two years ago, Jones designed her elaborate headdress, intricate rhinestones, and lavish peacock feathers. There's something that I always look for in a customer, um, which is a sense of fun, a sense of adventure, somebody who maybe doesn't have preconceptions about how they should be, who come in with an open mind. Many of his hats have acquired cult status in the fashion world. This beret, for example. Carla Bruni wore it the day she and her husband, France's president, Nicolas Sarkozy, paid an official visit to London. But the beret is only one of over 300 creations, which can be admired in the Victoria and Albert Museum until the end of May. And if you're interested in seeing any of those reports again, or others from Euromax, you'll find quite a lot on the internet at youtube.com slash Deutsche Welle English, all one word. Okay, that's all for now. Bye-bye.